Mm -hmm. All right, you can go ahead and begin. Hi, everybody. This is Kathy Bush, and welcome to the Dandelion Medical Webinar on the Environment of Caring in the NICU, the good, the bad, and the recommendations. Um, as Kathy just explained on the phone, we do have a new format. Um, I think it's really going to make things easier for everybody. We will explain it again at the end when we have the Q&A part, but I just wanted to let you know it is a little different, and we're very excited about it. Um, our pre presenter this morning is Dr. Robert White. Uh, Dr. White grew up in Buchanan, Michigan, attended the University of Notre Dame, and received his medical training at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and the Johns Hopkins Hopkins Hospital. Since 1981, he's been the director of the Regional Newborn Program at Memorial Hospital of South Bend, Indiana. He's had a long-standing interest in the effect of the NICU environment on babies, families, and caregivers, with many publications on that topic. He is chairman of the Consensus Committee that develops recommended standards for newborn ICU design, co-chair of the annual Gravens Conference on the Physical and Developmental Environment of the High-Risk Newborn, and Chairman of the International Conference on Brain Monitoring and Neuroprotection in the Newborn. He has appointments at the University of Notre Dame and the Indiana University School of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. White, and we really look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, and I apologize for the technical problems. They're all on my end. Um, Kathy and Kathy had everything set up perfectly, so I apologize, and you're going to hear me say next slide many times, but um, we'll have to do it a little bit old-fashioned. So uh, the next slide shows my disclosure statement. I have no conflicts of interest. And then we go to the slide that talks about the NICU environment of care, why it matters. I think this is something we all understand, but in our day-to-day -day work, we sometimes lose sight of. So for babies, What's happening in the NICU is a crucial period of brain growth and development, but it's also important to remember that this is a key experience for families. It's a defining moment for their relationships. With their baby, obviously, you know families go through a lot of stresses on relationships, so with each other, for many, it's their most intense experience with the healthcare system, and they uh, form opinions of, about us and the system, and even spiritually, this is um, a time of trial and, and growth for many people. And for us, what we do in the NICU largely defines who we are, and it needs to be an environment that is uh, positive, supportive for that. So let's go back to the baby part of it. Next slide. This is the visual for what's happening to babies' brains while they're with us. So if you look at the upper right at 28 weeks and compare it to term, the growth during that three-month period of time is 400% of size and complexity of the brain. That's happening in three months' time. And that's comparable to the 400% growth that occurs from the birth of a full-term baby until adulthood. So there's an incredible amount of growth and development occurring in utero under natural conditions, but with us, for better or for worse, in the NICU when babies are born early. The next slide gives you another visual for this. This is called the synaptic big bang. And most of the research was done in animals, so you will see phase one, phase two, phase three, which are roughly comparable to the trimesters. So during the first two trimesters, growth of synapses in the brain are very limited. But then in the third trimester, there's this explosion, this big bang that continues beyond term into the fourth trimester, if you will, and then at a very high rate throughout childhood. When we get to puberty, our, our synapses start to uh, pare down. We start to form, solidify our opinions about things. When we get to adulthood, um, we're in a phase where we're gradually making fewer synapses, and, and then in old age, we, we really tail off. But the Big Bang happens when those babies are with us. And the next slide shows the parts of the brain where those synapses are being formed. So in adults, the top 10 areas where synapses are being formed are primarily in the learning 
areas. Association information processing is what we're doing right now when we're talking with each other. But in babies, it's all happening in the sensory areas. So visual, auditory, sensory motor, these are the areas of the brain that are developing synapses right under our care. And um, again, for better or for worse, very much dependent on the care that we're giving them. The next slide talks about some common myths. I think we do understand to a large extent that these are myths, and yet we also continue to treat babies as if some of this were true. So we used to think of babies' brains as a blank slate, and, and they would gradually learn as, as they were out in the world. But we know now that babies who are born at term recognize the smell of their mother's breast milk from tastes that they experience in utero in the amniotic fluid, and they recognize their mother's voice on day one. So that learning process has been occurring in utero, and we are not working with a blank slate. We have babies who have already learned certain things in utero, and then we need to reinforce them and help them learn new things under our care. Babies' brains are extraordinarily resilient. A stroke in a baby of a comparable size to one in an older person is not nearly as damaging as it would be in that older person. But they're not infinitely resilient. So certainly injury and, and long-term damage can occur. And we need to know that everything we do to babies has that potential for good or harm. We think of babies at rest during sleep, and in fact, that's true at every other stage of life. We don't learn during sleep. Sleep learning was a fad back when I was growing up, and, and I can tell you from personal experience that it, it did not work. I, I didn't do any better on my chemistry exams in college than, than I would have if I hadn't been playing those tapes at night. Um, so I learned pretty quickly. I didn't learn during sleep, and the rest of us don't either. But babies do. There is good data that shows that newborn babies learn even while they're asleep, which is good because they sleep for many hours a day. But we have to understand that what they hear, what they feel, what we expose them to even during sleep will influence them and will influence that synaptic formation. So babies are not too young to retain a memory they may not be able to recall these events years later, but their brain solidifies that information into a memory, and they can become sensitized or habituated or conditioned to the stimuli that we provide them. Next slide. One of the ways to understand how important the environment is for babies is to recognize that we are altricial mammals. There are two types of mammals, altricial and precocial. Precocial are the ones that, at the time of birth, are able to ambulate and um, seek food and escape from danger, at least to some extent, on their own. So think of horses, goats, um, camels. Mostly the hooved animals fit into this category. They're able to walk soon after birth uh, can come find their mother for food or protection, can run away from danger. But altricial mammals, which humans are, are incapable of that. They are totally dependent on their mothers, not only for food and warmth and um, protection from danger, but also for many of these other things that are shown there, uh, both directly and, and via the mother's milk and, and her contact. Next slide. So when we start to talk about kangaroo care, we have to think about it as a truly biological environment of care, not just a nice thing to do for the mothers or the babies. And in fact, when you look at each of the sensory stimuli and compare whether they would be better in the mother's arms or closer to what the babies experience in utero, better in the mother's arms versus in the incubator or warmer, there's just no comparison at all. If we want to get the best sensory stimuli to babies, we cannot do it in an incubator or a warmer. Next slide. So let's talk about some myths that are related to the incubator. We think about these devices as something that are optimal for temperature control. 
and indeed they are very precise. But let me take you back many years ago to when we first decided what temperature babies should be kept in in the incubator. Those studies were done back in the 70s that showed that at a particular point, which we now call the thermal neutral temperature, the basal metabolic rate for babies was at its minimum. And if you kept the babies colder or warmer than that thermal neutral point, they used more calories. So the idea at the time was if we use that number, then we're going to minimize the amount of calories babies use to stay warm or to keep themselves cool, depending on which end of the spectrum you're at. And that will maximize the number of calories that will be available for growth. I came to question that <clears throat> when I heard that babies who were kept skin to skin were about one degree warmer while they were skin to skin than this thermal neutral point that we choose for the incubators. And I wondered why that might be the case. When I looked at the temperature that babies are typically in utero, it turns out that it's very close to this temperature that babies are when they're skin to skin with their mothers, warmer than that thermal neutral point. And so then I started to think, if the brain is the most metabolically active part of the body, particularly in premature newborns, should we really be picking the temperature at which the metabolic rates are at their minimum? Maybe we are intended, babies are intended, not to be at their basal metabolic rate, but at a growth, if you will, metabolic rate that creates more body heat and keeps them at a temperature, optimal temperature, whether skin to skin or in utero, that's higher than what we choose in the incubators. Another feature about incubators is that they're very good about keeping babies' temperatures exactly the same 24 hours a day. But that isn't how it is in utero, and that isn't how it is once kids go home. They have a circadian rhythm. And we don't know how important the circadian rhythm is other than to say that every living organism, from single-cell organisms to humans, have circadian rhythms. So I'm not sure that incubators are the best place for babies for temperature control for a couple of reasons. We also think about them as optimal for infection control. But here's the reality. You are as likely to find MRSA or Pseudomonas or multiple, multiple antibiotic-resistant pathogens on an incubator as you are on the mother's skin. The difference is that the mother's skin has probiotic bacteria, lots of probiotic bacteria, and incubators don't. So maybe incubators aren't the best place for infection control. And we know now with the Cochrane Review that infection rates are lowered by kids who are receiving kangaroo care. And there may be other dangers about incubators as well. So. We need to, I think, rethink about our comfort level with incubators compared to skin-to-skin -skin care. Next slide. So there's lots of evidence, in fact, that skin-to-skin -skin care and, and other elements of maternal care are very valuable for babies. Dr. Scher from Rainbow Babies showed that if you did skin-to-skin -skin care one and a half hours a day, four days a week for eight weeks, you could show at the end of that period accelerated brain maturation, as demonstrated by EEG. At Karolinska, they did a study that, uh, with a new design of their unit with single-family rooms, allowed presence of the family 24 hours a day and demonstrated a decreased length of stay and incidence of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And I'll talk about that study a little bit more in a few minutes. Another study showed that just training parents about the neurosensory needs of their baby then led to improved white matter development when they did brain scans at term equivalent. Cochrane Review showed that infant massage by parents improved weight gain. The Pfeiffer study is the one that showed that infants learn during sleep. The next slide, the data continues. So we know that exposure to parental talk increases babies actually becoming vocal themselves and their language and cognitive scores. Kangaroo care reduces DSATs. It improves cerebral motor pathways even when tested in adolescence. 
So we kind of know that what we do in the NICU has lifelong impact, but here's a study that actually did follow patients out to that age and, and showed that they had better brain development even as adolescents. Another Cochrane study showed that kangaroo care reduces mortality, sepsis length of stay. And you see some more studies there that have just come out about family nurture intervention and family integrated care. The key thing to understand about this is even though that's a solid body of evidence, it's an incredibly larger body of evidence in animals that document this. We just haven't been exposed so much to it because it doesn't show up in our literature, but there's very, very good evidence that demonstrates how important the baby's contact with the mother in these first days and weeks after birth can be. Next slide. This is not a new concept. Even back in the 1970s when NICUs were first getting started, the point was made that our responsibility is to help the family care for their babies, not usurp the parent's role. Next slide shows that in utero, babies, of course, are 100% of the time in contact with their mother. And the study I referred you to that we'll talk more about in a couple of minutes, in Stockholm, babies were skin to skin with their parents 70% of the time, much less than that in the US. So these numbers, uh, on the right, the typical U.S. center is about 1%. The good U.S. center is about 3%. Those two numbers were generated from a Vermont-Oxford Quality Improvement Initiative that we did a few years ago. And the hospitals that participated in that were highly motivated, but at the start of the QI project, they were at the 1%. This was adding up the total number of kangaroo care hours for all babies in the course of a week, and then dividing that by 168 hours in the week times the number of babies in the unit. So one baby might have six or eight or, or 10 hours with a particular parent, but a whole bunch of other babies had zero hours. And, and when you did the math, you ended up with 1% overall. And at the end of the QI project, we ended up with 3%, which is a three times improvement. So that's pretty impressive. And remember that even at 3%, that SHARE study that I told you about, 1.5 hours a day, four days a week, six hours a week, is about 3%. So even 3% can make a difference, but we do indeed have a long way to go. Next slide. So what we know today is that all mam mammals, infants of all mammalian species, suffer if they don't have extensive intimate contact with their mothers. We know that skin-to-skin -skin care has been efficacious in all cultures studied, whether it's Africa or Latin America or Sweden or Cleveland. We know that most of our NICUs were built without much consideration of that, but even in those that are, we know that we haven't done a real good job of recognizing responding to this science. And so that's one of the major focuses for this presentation. Next slide. And let's not forget families and caregivers, because the same is true for us. We know that the physical environment has a strong influence on human performance and well-being, and we have that data for families and for caregivers in hospitals and in other work settings. We just haven't taken as good care of our families and ourselves as we should. Next slide. So to sum up this portion, I want to make the point that if you really want to understand NICU design, you need to know not only neonatal biology, but also many of these other disciplines. Lots of the research is not published in our literature, but that doesn't make it less relevant. It just makes it less available to us, but it's equally important, and there's a lot of good evidence out there of what I'm going to tell you in the next section. Next slide um, shows what I think should be our working premises. So we would all agree that babies deserve the best treatment available. The second one, babies and parents should not be separated because of inadequate space or restrictive policies. That happens all the time right now. We don't have enough space to keep babies and moms together or we have policies that separate them. And, and I think it's 
fair to say that we should change our concept of that and that this second bullet point should be one of our working premises. The third is that the commitment of a hospital to babies and families should be as great or greater as any other program because the stakes are higher. Nowhere else in the hospital are babies' brains being developed like they are in the NICU. Every place tries to save lives and, and they help their patients, but there's something special, extra, about the NICU that has a long-term impact, and so a hospital's commitment should be as strong or stronger to our area as any other part of the hospital. And then finally, the environment should meet the needs of all those who inhabit it, babies, families, and caregivers. Slide. And that brings us to individualized environments. Single family room is a term that many of you have heard. Um, they are now the standard in other areas of the hospital for new construction. They aren't required yet for NICUs, but it certainly is a growing trend in ICUs both here and around the world. But it's fair to ask, are they a good idea? Are there hazards? Are there pitfalls? Because the answer turns out to be yes. You can do it wrong. You can put kids in single family rooms and actually um, put them at a disadvantage. And so we need to talk about how to get that right. Next slide. So the rationale for single family rooms is that this is the optimal environment for most babies. And the reasons are listed there. It's the optimal environment for most families. And again, there are reasons listed. If you go to the next slide, even caregivers benefit from the opportunity for us to have some of our functions not in the direct patient care area. We need different lighting. We, we need different music. We need to talk about our kids' soccer games in an area that isn't the immediately adjacent to a critically ill baby and their family. Next slide shows this too is not a new concept. Um, these were kind of private rooms, if you will, back in the 1400s. Um, and we've come a long way since then, of course. But um, I, I think some of what we're discovering now is, is what people knew long ago and, and we got away from for various reasons. Next slide. So there are many adult and pediatric units that have shown that single family rooms are feasible. There's a lot of NICUs out there now that show that it's practical but we have also learned that you can do it wrong. And one way you can do it wrong is building single family rooms without including the family. So if, if you have a culture that does not encourage families to stay and do kangaroo care, and then you build a single family room unit, you're not doing anybody any favors because families are an integral part of this concept. Next slide. Here's the study from Stockholm. So what they did was in their move from a open design NICU to single family rooms, because they were on two floors of the hospital, they decided to renovate one floor first, make all single family rooms, and then stop and run a randomized controlled trial. So babies were randomly allocated either to the floor that had all single family rooms or to the floor that still had the open design. Same doctors, same nurses, same policies and procedures. Only difference was that now families could stay 24 seven, and they did. They were very supportive already of family care and kangaroo care, so the big difference in the two studies, in the two locations, I should say, was that families were able to and did in fact stay extended periods of time. And when they looked at babies under 30 weeks gestation, they showed a greater than 10 day reduction in the length of stay in the ICU portion of their hospitalization. And their total stay was also reduced by that same 10 days. Pretty dramatic improvement in care uh, just by making it possible for families to stay and spend extended time with their kids. They also showed a, a reduction in moderate or severe BPD, which is already pretty low in that area, and they showed a further reduction as well. Next slide shows some data from 
a unit in West Virginia. This was using historical controls. They went from an open unit to all single-family rooms and just compared before and after. Showed a pretty dramatic reduction in apnea events. This has also been reported from a number of other hospitals uh, anecdotally, but this was well documented in West Virginia. They had a reduction in TPN days because they got babies up to full feedings more rapidly, more days of maternal breast milk. Mothers were more successful in pumping and providing milk for their babies, a reduction in sepsis, and obviously a reduction in noise levels. The next slide shows a picture of the single family room unit in um, South Dakota. And then the following slide shows some of the data they got. So we've looked at babies. Let's look at families. And they interviewed families, did a questionnaire. Uh, again, this was a historical control where they went from all open to all single family rooms. And families thought the unit was much more family friendly. You see a big change in that uh, metric. But look also that the families even thought that the staff worked better together, that the care given to their baby was improved, the family care that they received was better. So these were the same nurses. And I'm not sure that they really did work better together or gave better care to the baby, but the family perceived that to be the case. and. And even that, I think, has value. When they looked at their costs, they looked at um, total operating costs. So the study from Sweden looked at length of stay. In this case, they looked at their total operating costs and showed a 15% reduction in their costs after moving to the single-family room unit. Probably a lot of that was in length of stay, but they didn't break it down separately. Next slide. In Vanderbilt, they interviewed families. That's a hybrid unit that has some open areas and some single family rooms. And they interviewed families who had spent time in both of those areas. And the families confirmed that the single family rooms were better for many reasons for them. And physicians found that when they went to the single family room area, families were more likely to be present and to participate in rounds with them than they had been in the open area. Next slide shows one key important thing to remember though. Privacy and isolation are two sides of the same coin. So privacy is important. Families need it. We have a HIPAA requirement to provide it. But isolation can occur, not only of parents, but also of staff. And one of the adverse effects of that um, was a study that most of you probably heard about, reported in Journal of Pediatrics this year, and uh, previously reported at the Gravens Conference. Bobby Pineda showed that in their unit, when they had babies in private rooms, those kids at 18 months of age had reduced language skills compared to those who had been in the open area. One of the important things to know about that study is that the culture of the staff and the culture of the families, perhaps, didn't encourage staying overnight. So although they had private rooms, families did not have a comfortable place to stay overnight. They weren't encouraged to do so. It was primarily an inner city population. They were, Bobby thought, less inclined to do so. So we had the situation where kids were off in isolation rooms by themselves. Um, rather than it really being a family room. So these things can be addressed by good design, by programs, by staff awareness and culture, and even, I will argue, by not putting every single kid into a single family room. Next slide. So we've talked about babies and families. Um, let's talk about staff. And this study was done in St. Paul Children's. You may have to click it a couple of times to get both pictures up, but it shows you on the right the patient room and then on the left the nursing corridor. And the key thing to note here is that the only nurses stations they had were these flyby stations uh, just outside of the rooms. There was no central nursing station. So if you go to the next slide, you will see that 
staff perceives the private room environment to be better than open bay for many reasons, including their own work environment and job quality, and even their own quality of life off the job, but they thought the open bay was better than the private room for interacting with other members of the team. But the key point here to remember is they didn't build a place for those interactions to occur. Nurses were intentionally intended to keep at the bedside separated from one another, and it's no surprise then that they felt isolated from their teammates. Next slide. So I think there are some reasons to consider open space along with single family rooms. Single family rooms may lead to isolation of babies or isolation of families. And obviously we should have some rooms where we can take care of twins or higher order multiples as well. So I think the case can be made that some open rooms may still be desirable. Next slide. And here's the way I think about it. If you have single family room with parents, you have home. Uh, home away from home at least, and natural neonatal neuroprotection. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Single family room without parents is an isolation room, and the babies are being deprived of normal sensory input. Next slide. Here's the neuroprotection concept. That's a hot topic these days. So we know that getting normal flora into babies as opposed to the pathogens that float around the hospital all the time enhances their brain development by reducing their exposure to cytokines and other inflammatory substances. We know that mother's milk has many bioactive substances that support brain growth. <clears throat> we know about appropriate sensory stimuli. We've talked a lot about that, and we could spend a whole other hour talking about how to encourage appropriate sensory stimuli for babies. And we know that extended maternal contact improves brain development. And here's the cool thing. That this extended maternal contact gives you a virtuous cycle feeding back to all those first three. So if you have babies in extended contact with their mothers, they're gonna get more exposure to probiotic flora. Mother's gonna be able to breastfeed longer. She'll have more prolactin stimulation. She'll be more effective in providing breast milk for the babies. And obviously, she's going to be providing appropriate sensory stimuli with movement and smell and talking and visual input for the babies. So the best environment for babies is this extended maternal contact. And we need to remember that single family rooms are a means to an end. They do not replace the mother's arms as the optimal environment. Next slide. So here's the visual for that. Um, this is neonatal neural protection at its best. Next slide. And here's kind of a cute way of thinking about it. Maybe too cute, but we'll see. Um, see what you think. So developmental care according to Goldilocks. Go to the next slide then. If you take each of the sensory inputs, I think it's apparent that you can have, for most of them, too much or too little. So for example, if we go down to movement and kinesthetic, too much would be moving the baby around so much that we were disturbing their sleep. Too little would be maybe this inert bed that we put them in that never moves in an incubator. And the just right would be being held and, and gentle rocking by somebody. And you can go through each item on that list and identify what too much or too little would be and see that we do some of both, too much and too little, or a lot of both perhaps, in our current NICUs. But just right, if you go to the next slide, the Goldilocks principle is that skin-to-skin -skin care gets all of these just right. So um, if you go to the next slide, please, I want to um, get to a close with a couple of analogies. The first of these is how we felt about formula and breast milk back in the 70s. At that time, when I was just starting my training, we thought of formula as by far the best thing to feed premature babies. We knew that breast milk was inadequate in protein and calcium and phosphorus, that it wasn't sterile, that it was a real hassle to deal with, whereas with formula, 
we could make the recipe whatever that baby needed. We could give them more calcium and phosphorus and protein and, and caloric density, and, and we could get those kids to grow with formula. And, and we were pretty happy with that. And the only time we used breast milk is when the mother absolutely insisted on it. And usually that was a hippie mom, and, and we would be very careful to tell her all of the dangers. Um, and, and then maybe we could give the kids some breast milk. And now it's a complete turnaround. Uh, we use formula only when we have to. We understand that breast milk is, in fact, the best thing for babies, and perhaps we do have to fortify it, but that's the foundation that we want to start with. If you go to the next slide, I think we're at kind of an earlier stage of this paradigm shift with our environment of care. So today we think of the incubator and the warmer as a warm, secure place for the baby and, and putting the baby in mother's arms many times as being a hassle or risky. Whereas in the future, I think we're going to see that an incubator and warmer are devoid of human contact and normal stimuli and we'll use them only when we have to. And we will see the mother's arms as the best place for babies to be. Next slide. So here's a three-step approach to developmental care. Get the physical environment right. So that's the NICU design, new unit if you can. If you can't, there's lots of things you can do in your existing unit that will reduce noise, light, other noxious stimuli. The second thing is to get babies into their parents' arms. And then finally, there are principles of developmental care, whether it's NIDCAP or We Care or any of the other concepts that are out there I think it is less important which method you use and more important that you get the culture right, that people are really supporting developmental care. Next slide. One last concept I want to talk about is that we have an opportunity with design in the hospital to really affect the mental health of everybody in there. Maybe not so much the babies, but certainly the families and the staff. And we understand this. Architects understand it. The public understands it in churches, in airports, in hotels. And yet we don't do it nearly the way we should in, in hospitals. So designs that lift the spirit provide access to daylight and nature. They have scale. They're large. You don't feel enclosed in a tiny little area. They use color liberally. They use lots of curves and um, stay away from hard angles. And they incorporate life, um, movement. And when we get away from those things and just make little boxes for our spaces in the hospital, we treat our patients and our families and ourselves as less than fully human because we are not nurturing their spirits. Next slide. So here's the elevator speech. There is nowhere in the hospital where the period of brain development is more important. There is nowhere where the patient needs their family more. In this case, not only emotionally, which is true all through the hospital, but also biologically. And there is nowhere that is more life-changing for families than the NICU. So Good things happen throughout the hospital, but not as frequently or with the long-term impact of the NICU. And this is the elevator speech that we need all of our administrators and our leaders to understand when we're talking about why we need to get the environment of the NICU right. Next slide. Some resources are the recommended standards that Kathy mentioned at the outset. They are published in clinics and in, I'm sorry, Journal of Perinatology. There's a couple of clinics in perinatology that go into all of the sensory input for the fetus and, and premature newborn in great depth if you're interested in that, and of course the Gravens Conference. Next slide is my closing slide, and we can go to discussion. Great close, Dr. White. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a really rich presentation with lots of great information. 
Uh, <clears throat> we have, as we discussed in the beginning, a new format, and Kathy Randall is going to walk us through how to how we're going to try the Q and A uh, today. Kathy? Well, I'm not sure where she is, but we're going to try something new today. If you have a question, go up right above where the slides are. There's, you'll see Cam, Mike, Share, Notes, and My Mood. If you have a question or you want to say something, click on My Mood, and you'll see a place where you can raise your hand. Uh, once you raise your hand, if we see you do that. Uh, All we'll attendees are you. muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. So you've all been unmuted. If we call on you, you if you're on the phone, you'll have to unmute yourself by doing uh, star six. If you are on the computer speaking, all you'll have to do is just click on the microphone that's also in that top bar. So if you have a question. Kathy, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, now we can hear you. Okay, great. Okay, sorry. Um, so it looks like Gray Brown, you have a question. So I'm just wondering, you're on your computer. Do you have your microphone on and all of that? Um, and while you're maybe figuring that out, how to un unmute, perfect. Are you there, Gray? Yes. Can you hear me? All right, go ahead. Yes. Um, Dr. White talks about when a baby is born full term, that they're not a blank slate. I just wonder, you know, babies born um, as early as 24 weeks, what do we look at that? You see that slate because I encourage my parents to say, you know, hearing is the first sense to be seen and to use their voice to make contact with the baby. And so I just wondered, you know, what are we, what can you tell us? Um, for me, Gray, you kind of broke up in the beginning. So um, maybe can you just repeat the very beginning? I don't know, maybe you're Dr. White, if you heard it, you can go ahead. Yeah, actually, I heard the beginning better than the rest of it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, what can we expect from the blank slate or lack of the not slate of a preterm baby if a full-term baby is born um, with no Oh, impact? okay. Thank you. So, as you mentioned, um, there are different critical stages for the various senses. The touch and movement senses begin to come online late in the second trimester. So if we get a kid at 22, 23, 24 weeks, they are just beginning to have pretty good ability to uh, feel touch and pain and movement. The auditory, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, taste and smell come next and they are also forming towards the end of the second trimester into the beginning of the third trimester. So those two senses are also pretty much intact in most babies that we will get. The auditory processing is the most active area of the brain in the third trimester. So when the kids are with us, noise is probably the most significant external stimulus that is affecting brain development. And conversely, talk, maybe music, not a lot of solid data on that yet, but certainly some interesting data. Uh, those positive sensory inputs to the auditory system are probably most important in the third trimester. All of the rest of the senses that I mentioned before are still developing as well, but but they're pretty well intact. and. And then it's a matter of learning uh, new experiences where the senses themselves are working pretty well. By the time you get to the end of the third trimester, the auditory cortex is pretty well developed. Again, we continue to learn throughout that time, but the rapid growth of synapse formation has started to level off. And then the visual stimuli, those are predominantly endogenously generated from within the baby's own brain while the kid is in utero or even ex utero in the third trimester. And the information that's coming from the retina doesn't really amount to much until the kid gets to term. So that's the piece that 
we can put things in front of kids' eyes at 24 weeks or 30 weeks, but they probably won't gather much information from that. As you know, when we do ROP exams, most of that retina isn't even vascularized at that point. So there aren't neurons that are collecting visual information. They are collecting circadian information, interestingly enough. So we know that by 28 to 32 weeks, the circadian system is intact, and the neurons in the retina that collect that information do send those signals to the brain. But the circadian neurons, retinal ganglion cells, I should say, are different than the visual ganglion cells that collect our visual information that aren't really functioning until near to term. Thank and I you, hope Dr. that Wendell. answered your question. Uh, I didn't quite understand it the first time through, but I hope that's what you were getting at. Yeah, no, I think it's really interesting, that, that whole blank slate idea, and um, I think you really recapped it well. Um, let's see. So if someone else would like to raise their hand, we can kind of scroll through. I'll look for maybe one of the other. Um... So there's a question um, from Kara at BC um, Women's who's asking a little bit more about cycled lighting and circadian rhythm. So I don't know if that's opening up a whole can of worms that would take an hour's presentation itself, <laughs> but maybe if you have a a short idea of our short explanation of kind of where we are with the data we have on that. Sure. And I have done an hour presentation on that in the past because it is an <laughs> item imagine. of much interest to me. And so thank you for the question. So back in the 80s, we thought that we had to have the lights on bright all the time. We didn't have saturation monitors. And uh, the only way we could tell if kids had good perfusion and good oxygenation was to look at them and occasionally get a blood gas. And so we had bright lights on 24-7. Once we had transcutaneous oxygen monitors were the first ones that came along, we started to ask whether it might be better for babies to at least turn the lights off at night. And studies were done. Actually, the first one that was done in an NICU was done in our unit here uh, and showed the babies did better if you turned the lights off at night. They had better growth. They had shorter length of stay. They had better scores on their Brazelton exam. Some people took that information and thought, well, if turning them off at night is good, then maybe turning them off all the time is even better because, after all, in utero, they, they're they in continuous darkness. I didn't think that was such a good idea for a couple of reasons, first being that in utero they do get other circadian information from their mother. They, they aren't dependent on light to give them circadian information, um, so they do develop circadian rhythms in utero. And... And secondly, um, now that they're out of the uterus, light probably is their best way of telling day and night. turns out that breast milk has circadian rhythms too um, in cortisol and melatonin and protein and calcium, and maybe that's a secondary way. But uh, babies definitely can tell day and night visually uh, at least by 28 to 32 weeks. So some further studies were done that compared continuous dim lighting to day-night cycling, and they also showed that day-night cycling was better than continuous dim lighting. So there's good data that um, cycled lighting gives better outcomes for babies than either continuous bright or continuous dim lighting. Now, you will also hear Dr. Graven say that he thinks exposing babies to any kind of light or visual stimulus is inappropriate before term because the brain isn't intended to collect that information. And I will agree with him up to the 28 to 32 week point where even the circadian part of the eye isn't functional. So in babies under 28 weeks, can, keeping them in continuous dim lighting is probably just as good as in uh, cycled lighting. But once they get past 28 to 32 weeks, we have shown, we have Dr. Graven's argument is kind of a philosophical one, but the randomized controlled trials have shown the babies do better in cycled lighting once they get past 28 weeks. Thanks. 
Um, sorry, I keep putting myself on mute, so I'm sure there's no noise. Um, so there's just a couple other little quick questions. I don't know if anybody else um, wants to raise their hand. I'm trying to just scan down. It looks like Una um, McFadden from Fourth Valley Royal Hospital. I don't know if you're still there and have a question for Dr. White. And if you would like to unmute your line. Um, and again, just while you're, um, Una, while you're doing that, I just want to remind everyone also, while you're currently not speaking, please be sure that your lines are muted. It will help eliminate any echoes as well. So, Una, um, go ahead and let's see if it works. It looks like you're unmuted, but I'm not yet hearing you. So um, maybe we, it could be that your mic is not configured um, or the volume is muted on your mic. Do you want to go ahead and text your question in, um, Una? Um, and in the meantime, I'll go ahead and um, maybe read one of these others. Um, with the NAS population, um, so this is a question from Deborah Lee at Nationwide. Um, so with the NAS population, mothers are rarely present. Is skin to skin by another family member or an adult beneficial? Or I guess, or what other solutions would you offer for that population that is sometimes challenging and, or challenged with visits? Yeah, that is a, a very important population that we're all seeing more of. I'm not sure about skin to skin. It's clear that those kids respond very positively to being held and rocked and and soft music uh, being sung to them. So I we do use volunteers for that purpose, and, and I think that is beneficial. It's long been held that those kids do better in rooms that are dark and quiet and, and minimal sensory input, and so that may be helpful, too, at least for the first couple of days until you're getting the kid um, stabilized on whatever medication you're going to use to control withdrawal. So I don't think that you need to keep kids in this sensorial, sensorially deprived environment for a long period of time, but maybe for this first couple of days while you're getting them out of the worst of the withdrawal and, and onto some sort of maintenance medication that you'll gradually wean down. And, and once you have control and, and your Finnegan scores or whatever scoring system you're using are decent, then that kid should get the same kind of external stimuli as any other kid. And if if you need other folks and volunteers are, are a great choice for this to provide some of that when the parents aren't available so much the better. Those kids probably are kids that in the first few days would be best in a private room where you could really keep them from exposure of, of commotion that's going on elsewhere in the unit. But later, if the family is not going to be there, might be one of those kids that would be better in a more open setting where they would at least hear some other human voices and get some other um, sensory input that they might not receive in a private room with no family visiting. Thank you. So a um, question from Una <clears throat> was unable to um, get, or we weren't able to hear her voice, so I'll read her question for you. Um, it is say, asking about excessive noise. So wondering if you have any references about excessive noise during the NICU correlating with later noise hypersensitivity in childhood, um, as has been described um, for some ex preemies at school age. Um. I think there is some data out there. I am not familiar enough with it to give you a, a good answer on that. I'm sorry. Um, so it, it's a good thing to be thinking about, and, and I think there are kids who are hypersensitive to noise and certain noises in particular later on in life. I I don't know that single-family rooms or some other intervention will prevent that. We can hi hypothesize that that's the case, but I am not sure that anybody has looked at this beyond the issue of language. Uh, but in terms of response to noise, I'm pretty sure that there 
there are not good comparisons before and after single family room environments. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I just saw another one. So there's just some comments um, from Leslie at MUSC that they, um, they're going to have a new unit in about five years. And at present, their unit is very compact. And that they, her concern is that when you move to the family, um, single family room model, especially for the small babies, 24, 27 weekers, that you may miss subtle signs that tell you the baby's change, having a change in condition. And you know, looking at vent, vent volumes and work of breathing, et cetera. So what have, what have you heard or what have you experienced um, that would either reassure Leslie or validate her concerns about missing these subtle things that we see being so close to the babies now? Yeah, so every single nurse who goes from an open unit to a single family room environment has those same concerns. And I can tell you that there are several units now that have specifically addressed, and the West Virginia one and the South Dakota one that I gave you some other data from are two in particular that have looked at safety issues and shown that there is no increase in adverse events after they move to the single-family room unit, and in some cases, a reduction in adverse events such as apnea. But the proviso for that is that that's only achieved by good planning, by good electronic um, systems that will tell you wherever you are what's going on with your baby um, and the opportunity to do some tri trial runs, um, some simulations before you actually get to the new unit to make sure you know how you're going to know if your baby's in trouble and how you will respond to it. So it's a valid concern, but it is one that is definitely addressable and manageable. And I think in balance, um, there is some evidence that kids end up being safer in the single family room environment. Great. So I think we maybe can take maybe one or two more. Are you okay with time? It's right yes. at the top of the hour? Okay. Um, so Nick from Ohio has a, a question saying, a lot of do dollars are spent on incubators, and what will, of course, those vendors think um, when they are begin to realize that parents are the best incubators? And and I think, you know, obviously you've made a, an amazing case for that. So the, the question continues on, what do we need, and I'm going to isolate this to the United States. Um, for this to move from just a good idea to a standard practice, and does it mean longer-term leave for parents until babies come home? And and so I'll ask you to put on your advocacy hat and say, so we're all committed to thinking about babies and families' health. So what is it that we need to do and say as healthcare practitioners to whomever? What is the message and to whom should we say it to make this a reality? Um, let me start with the incubator piece and move back to that one then. Okay. All of the incubator manufacturers understand that they need to to do a better job. I've talked with all of them, They and not because I've had to seek them out. They've solicited input uh, from many of us in the field. They recognize that their incubators need to be more family-friendly. So the incubators that have the hydraulic adjustments now for example, um, aren't just for the nurses being some of them five feet tall and others of them being six feet tall, but you can actually get the incubator down to a level that if a mom is sitting next to the baby, it's a pretty easy transfer out of the incubator into mother's arms. So they've already started to make some of those adjustments. They're trying to make their incubators not so noisy. It doesn't do much good to build a single family room unit and have the single room nice and quiet, but the baby is still in an incubator at 55 decibels. So they understand these issues, and and whoever comes out with the first truly family-friendly, kangaroo care-friendly, um, best environment for the baby incubator is going to sell a lot of them, and, and the other companies are going to be scrambling 
um, with their next generation incubators as well. So I think that issue will get addressed um, over the next few years. As far as family leave policy, um, you are right that that is a big element in whether we can really make this a reality for our babies because the fact is if families don't have extended leave and they don't get paid if they do take leave in the first place, many, many families are just not going to be able to or, or will at least choose not to spend that time with their babies but go to work. So advocating for babies in, in that situation means collecting more and more data that show that one of the reasons we are having poor outcomes and increased infant mortality and increased costs of care is because we're not doing the low-tech things, that, that the solution is not just building us a new hospital and, and giving us fancy equipment, although certainly that's part of it too. You've got to have the single-family rooms. You've got to have appropriate incubators. But the easiest thing maybe um, for the baby is to have that skin-to-skin -skin contact with the mother. It's not the easiest thing politically or financially. It does have implications. But we have to show them that our babies do better, and we're starting to get that data, that our babies do better if they're with their mothers and help decision makers understand that this will, in fact, be the best way to save money in the long run. I think it's going to take a while to collect that data, so I, I don't think it's an easy argument to make with your legislators tomorrow, but I hope in 10 years we will have that kind of data. Well, I guess the, the outcomes that we're seeing from other parts of the world will, will help that as well. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. White. Go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, I think our time is up for today. I don't want to hold anyone up. I just... Uh, Dr. White, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your passion about single-family rooms. I think your your information was really compelling. Um, this webinar was brought to you by Dandelion Medical, and we're so pleased to have experts like Dr. White as part of our webinar series. Uh, Dandelion believes strongly that all babies should have the best start possible, and we try in all our products to do the best we can. Uh, there'll be two places on the evaluation. Um, that we are gonna offer some, some free products today. One is uh, a gel pillow, and there'll be more information on the evaluation, but we've heard many units are not able to get gel pillows right now, and Dandelion does have many uh, sizes. And also the ca our Kangaroo Cuddler, which is a very reasonably priced, uh, simple device that can help moms and babies and dads and babies um, safely kangaroo for long periods of time. So to move along, in order to receive your free CE, you're, you will need to fill out the webinar evaluation. Um, in the chat area, hopefully, uh, Kathy will be able to uh, put that wet, the URL up again for that. But otherwise, once we're finished, um, you'll be immediately redirected to the evaluation form if your firewall allows. At the end of the evaluation form, you'll receive a link to the CE certificate that you need to download and keep for your record. If you don't have time to fill out the evaluation right now or your hospital is blocked access, you will be receiving an email within the next few hours with a link to the evaluation as well as a link to the recording and a PDF of Dr. White's slides. If you're viewing as a group, you must each log on individually to the evaluation form in order to get the CE. And please visit the Dandelion Medical website for future webinars and also links to the recordings of our previous 18 webinars that are all still active and available for continuing education credit. So thank you all so much for listening. Have a great weekend. And thanks again, Dr. Way. You really did a fabulous job. Thanks, Kathy.